Marxism, these are some of the key ideas, some of the key values <coughs> through that moral theory. Uh, rationality. And we're going to talk a lot about that in just a minute. Uh, freedom, which is going to be tied together with rationality. Um, duties, fulfilling duties. And then choices. Um, and Stoicism is a, is a moral theory that appeals to a lot of people who are motivated by these sorts of values, especially duty. Um, you find Stoicism um, probably most discussed by military people, or people in sort of military kind of situations, where you have some sort of opposition that you're dealing with. And where you, you also, you know, if we use that word Stoic, what does that call to mind for you? Somebody has a stoic demeanor, or somebody has a stoic attitude towards things. Yeah. A uh, person that doesn't care. Okay, very good. Person who doesn't care. We also use it in sports too, don't we? I think. Uh, yeah. Maybe that doesn't show emotion. Doesn't show emotion. Yeah, that that fits in. Well, maybe we think that they don't care in part because they they don't readily show emotions. Yeah. But they're like uh, very confident and statuesque. Okay. Making things like a hero. Okay. Um, confidence. Um, they stake out a stand, and, and that's that's where they are. Um, those are those are all aspects of what we in our popular culture call call stoic. And the stoic person it, it tends to be somebody who's both a duty driven <laughs> and who is free, free of their emotions, free of what other people think of them. They're able to commit themselves to something and say, well, you know, if you don't like it, tough. Okay? Um, and we have a lot of movie heroes that are kind of stoic. You know, um, they take pain and they, they don't let it you know, affect them the way it does other people. They, they <coughs> take a lot of uh, fear. That's one emotion that they often don't seem to show. Uh, you can think of action heroes you know, are often supposed to be kind of stoic. Some of our dramas have stoic characters. Um, all of that actually makes sense. All of that ties in with this, this moral theory. We'll, we'll see why, um, how did you put it? it was, there's the not showing emotions, the not caring. We'll see why a stoic, and in what sense a stoic, really doesn't care, uh, and sees that as a good thing. But first I want to talk about um, this part. So rationality. This is something that's distinctive to us humans. We've talked about this before with Plato. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, when we talked about hedonism, you know, there's certain pleasures that human beings can enjoy that other animals don't. Um, what's distinctive about us? What makes us distinctively a different kind of creature, a higher kind of creature than, say, a dog or even a, a chimpanzee? Um, we're pretty close to us, you know. Physically, we're only 2% different the genetics. You know, the DNA of us is 98% chip DNA. Um, but that 2% that makes a big difference, apparently. Um, rationality. Epictetus talks about something that he calls the <coughs> ruling part. Um, he also speaks in terms of reason, right? Or the rational, or the he uses the word contemplative faculty. Um, and the emphasis here is all on the ability to see itself and to see other things. Another aspect of this that's equally important is what he calls moral purpose. Or sometimes it's translated as the will. The, uh, also has um, faculty of choice. And for the Stoic, not only are we different from the other animals in that we can do something that they can't. We, we can actually back up from ourselves and look at ourselves. A dog doesn't ask itself, am I a good dog? It, it learns it's a good dog from humans, or it learns it's a bad dog and it learns what, what counts as that. Right? And sometimes there can be struggles. Um, but a dog doesn't actually question itself and say, is my life on the right track? 
Um, I mean, in cartoons, right? But in cartoons, they also wear pants and you know have jobs and things like that. They're modeled after human beings. Um, we anthropomorphize animals. Um, we don't know whether whether chimpanzees, you know, even if they are taught sign language, who teaches them sign language? It's not them. It's us. We sort of project that onto them. We don't know whether they have conversations about whether they're good chimpanzees or not. Uh, they don't ask, what is my good? How should I achieve my good? They don't, they don't plan that sort of thing out. They don't ask themselves, is, is my life on a good track so far? Or do I need to make some changes? You know, they certainly don't you know, have midlife crises or you know, have a birthday. Or sometimes people you know, do these considerations at New Year's and say, man, I need to get my life together. Um, we do. You guys, by this point in your life, I'm willing to bet that you have gone through at least several different crisis moments where you had to decide what kind of person you wanted to be, not just then, but for the, for the future, and where you may have decided to change the course of where you were going. And you were able to do that in part because you were able to step back and actually look at yourself. And you used the very faculty that um, you were scrutinizing to do that. Reason, rationality, or the ruling part, or the contemplative faculty is unique. It can look at itself. Um, your sense of vision can't look at itself. I mean, you can look in the, in the mirror, you know, look at your eyeballs or something like that. <laughs> You're putting it in your context. But that's not quite the same thing as actually judging itself. Um, and, and the same thing goes with the things that are below as well, your emotions, your desires, your aversions, and in short, your body. Does your, I mean, your body is a great thing. It's amazing. Think about it. Have any of you ever taken an anatomy class? Or have any of you ever gone to those um, museum displays? where they have those uh, um, bodies that have been preserved in, in some sort of plastic thing, and they, they pull all like the, the veins and capillaries out, and you can see how complex that is, or the nerves. Your body is just an amazingly put together machine, but your body doesn't have the capacity to reflect on itself. Your, your mind does, or a part of your mind, right? Your body is just your body. Great mass of stuff that all these interesting things. Um, your emotions, your desires, your aversions. Do your emotions reflect on themselves? When you're sad, does your sadness tell itself, hey, that's enough? <laughs> now now you, you ought to knock that off. Um, your, your mind can. You can actually tell yourself, I can't get myself out of this because this isn't healthy. This isn't Third day, I've just slept in all day and done nothing. Um, that, if you said that something like that to yourself, you know, these things happen. You were actually using that ruling part of yourself, reason, to tell yourself, "Hey, I got to get my act together. This thing that's going on here is not good." Um, when you felt joy, you know, did your joy ever say to itself, "This is really nice right now, but I got to kind of watch it because something might happen to." and then I'm not going to feel so hot. It doesn't work that way with emotions, does it? There's the cognitive part of you, and then there's the affective part of you, the part that feels, that desires, that yearns, that, that avoids, that fears, all these, these sorts of things that actually makes you do things. And this part can look at itself, this part can't. This part just does what it does. And this is the other aspect of it. You have the capacity to choose, and your choices are free. Dogs' choices aren't really free. Um, this might trouble you a bit if you think about you know, the fact that we reward and punish animals for choices that, in large part, they can't help themselves from making. Even little children, you know, aren't entirely free. I think I made. Have I told you guys about this thing that my, my little son did? Um, he's uh, just about to turn five. And 
so when he was solidly in the, the middle of the four-year-old thing, there was something that he did, and I don't remember what it was. And I said, if you do that again, you're going to get punished. He's probably he was messing with his sister in some way, you know, that he wasn't supposed to be doing, or probably driving or something like that. And what he said was really striking. Now, if, if I were to say to you, if you do that again, you're going to get punished. You understand this, right? Are you going to do it again? You'd be shocked. You would say, no, right? <laughs> I'm not going to do it again. You would choose not to do the thing that you don't, <coughs> that's going to get you punished because you don't like being punished. What he said, and this is so so evocative of that, that stage of life, he said, I hope I don't do it. Not, oh, well, then I won't do it. He realized, okay, if I do this, punishment happens. I don't like punishment, therefore I shouldn't do this. But he also sort of instinctively realized, I, I'm a little kid. I don't actually have control over this stuff entirely. I'm not altogether there when it comes to this. And what do we know about this? That's actually the case. Um, your capacity for um, self-control, for self-formation, all those sorts of things, it's not really fully developed, at least the parts of your brains that handle that, until you're in your 20s. Um, some say you know, 25 is a good average time. And you're, you're getting more and more um, adept at this, aren't you? Are you finding that as, as you're going on? It's not just that um, you're getting better and better at it. Your, your body is actually going still through some changes that is making it easier and easier for you to, to do this well. Um, you have a free will. You can choose not only what you do, you can choose who you're going to be, what kind of person you're going to be. Again, a dog can't do that. <coughs> if a dog doesn't want to get punished, it can change its behavior to avoid punishment. That's what happens. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're training the dog to do certain things, it's better actually if you get the dog to do what it likes to do naturally and then associate the rewards with that. Um, that's the more humane way to do it. But is the dog freely choosing that? Not really. Is the dog stepping back and saying, this is the kind of dog I want to be. I need to make these kind of choices in order to make that happen. I need to surround myself with positive role models, positive friends who are going to help me on my way to good dogginess. No, right? Again, that could happen in a cartoon, or I suppose now, you know, some live action movie where you know, they make the dog's lips move. And all that. well, that's not real life, is it? But you do that, don't you? You've probably done stuff like that, haven't you? How many of you have gotten rid of friends who you realize were a negative influence in your life? Yeah, most of you, right? That was a choice that you made freely because you actually reasoned something out you may have also done it because you didn't like to hang out with them anymore or something like that. There could have been other motives. But if you actually thought it out in terms of, I'm not as good of a person when I'm with this, this friend of mine who brings out the bad tendencies of me. i got to quit hanging out with them. you know, Because every time that I, I hang out with them, I end up acting like a jerk. And I don't want to be a jerk. You used this faculty of choice. And you used that not just to do one thing. You used that to try to change who you are, the structure of your motivations, the structure of your behavior. Um, so that's pretty important, isn't it? And, and if you want to boil stoicism down into a nutshell, it's going to be the good is to be found here. It's not to be found here. And it's certainly not to be found in things external to your body, outside of yourself. The good is to be found in developing who you are, developing your rationality, developing your freedom, doing that through duties, doing that through choices. Um, all these things are going to, to fit together. So one of the things that, that um, Epictetus asks you, and this is in the, the portion of the discourses that I, I had you read for this, he's talking about um, rationality, and he says, um, this is in chapter 2 of, of the first book of it. To the rational animal, that's you, only the irrational is intolerable. 
Only that which doesn't make sense. Only that which you know doesn't actually fit. That which is rational is tolerable. If you can understand why something has to be the case, you can you can put up with it. But if you can't understand why it's the case, if it doesn't make sense for you, if it doesn't fit in with these things, then you're going to be very upset by it. Uh, it says blows are not naturally intolerable getting hit. How is that? Well, see how the Spartans, that's the Lacedaemonians, endure whipping when they've learned that whipping is consistent with reason. Um, what are the sort of things that people put up with, bad treatment, when they realize that it's for their own benefit? What's that? Gym. Gym. Yeah, gym class. Um, you know, when is gym class a required thing now in school? It's not, it's not true, yeah. here, no. In so many schools it is. Ah, it should be, because, you know. I mean, it's, first off, there's a lot of fat kids out there, and that's not good, because they're not in gym class. And then, you know, gym class was, um, it was a time for a lot of kids to sort of pull off some steam. That's, uh, why deprive them of that? And then the other thing is, gym class was also, if it was done right, it was formational character. Uh, and one of the things that you had to do in gym class was play sports that you weren't good at. Right? I mean, you might go to, I mean, there were some kids who were like super athletes and they were great at everything. So I'm putting, putting those kids out of it. And then there were some kids who, no matter what happened, was, nothing was going to go away for them, right? Let's put them out. But for the, the bulk of the kids, you know, you might go into gym class and you, and you're, you like playing football and you're, you're good with that part of it, but you don't really like and you're not very good at playing volleyball. But you got to do it anyway, because the gym teacher says you have to. Well, you know, if you do that, you eventually you start to become a little bit better at it, and you develop those, those motor skills that are needed for that. And you also learn a very important life lesson. The world doesn't revolve around you and your desires or aversions. Right? Gym teachers are great for saying, suck it up. <laughs> Uh, and so I think it's, it's, it's kind of a bad thing to deprive kids of that, that sometimes unpleasant experience that, that I know I had. Did, did all of you have gym class? Yeah? So is it just kids now who don't have it? Or? That's, that's really too bad. Well, what do you mean kids now? Like in high school, they like still got it and everything budget. else. Like, you know, in elementary, I mean, we had it. Yeah, just in college, school, you don't have it. Every oh, other class. Oh, oh, okay. <coughs> yeah, well, you shouldn't have to. Okay. College, you're an adult. You can choose whether you exercise. Right? Where are you? No, this is money for yeah, gym class when elementary college was high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way it ought to be. That's, some places they don't though. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I didn't have to do gym class. Really? Yeah. Um, and then there are some schools that do like if you don't take a gym, you have to do a sport every yeah. season. Oh. Yeah. Well, that would be a, that would be a good substitute. So now think about a little bit some more. What are the what are the things you put up with? Physical things. Um, let's say you're doing a sport. Now you're not just in gym class. What do you put up with that you don't like? Well, at least at first. Running. Yeah, I'm running. Why, why don't Why don't you like running? Stinks. Okay, you, think, you have to do things you're good at. What were you going to say? It stinks, and I'm not good at it. So. Okay, so these are things you're not good at well, physically. What is it about running, let's say running for a couple of miles? It's challenging. Year. It's challenging. What's it like physically? Well, you get fatigued. You get sweaty, you get fatigued. Or you said something? Oh, you can't breathe. Yeah, it's, you can't breathe. Sometimes your lungs actually kind of hurt. Um, now, do that often enough, and what happens? What's up? You get used to it. You get better at it. Pretty soon a mile doesn't seem like anything to you. You start to acquire a capacity, greater capacity for, for lungs, your heart, you know, your cardiovascular activity, your heart gets stronger. Um, pretty soon you can do all sorts of things for 30 minutes straight that you didn't think you could possibly do for even five minutes straight. And that's a good thing, right? So if you realize that that's what you're aiming for, um, the first stuff that you don't really like, it makes sense, it's rational. <coughs> Um, if somebody just, you know, throws you, um, say, you're, you're, you're in an office now, and they say, all right, from now on we're doing an hour of calisthenics every morning. They do this in some places. You 
Christ. Oh, this is awful. What possible good is this? If I wanted to exercise, I would do that on my own. You know, uh, Then it doesn't make sense to you. Now, if somebody explains to you, well, we're doing this because it's important to us that we stay alive for a long time, um, because you know we're investing a lot of time and energy in you, you might still say, you know, you're kind of treating me as if I'm just an object, a tool. I don't really like that. If they said something to you like, well, you know, this is for your good. We want you to live a long time because we're concerned about your your health. Then you might say, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do the do the jumping jack. Um, my cousin worked at Marshall and Sterling on Main Street, yeah. and they pay a yoga instructor to come in once a week for everybody yeah. if they want to go. Yeah, sometimes companies <laughs> offer incentives too if you're willing to do this sort of thing. Um, or you can I'll just say that I can Incentives? Yeah. yeah. Those tend to work better than just hurting everybody and saying, you're going to do this now. Yeah, that tends to be bad for morale, at least for American companies. In some, some countries, that's just what the companies do. Um, so, let's go on with this. He says, uh, the rational and the irrational appear such in a different way to different persons, just as the good and the bad, the profitable and the unprofitable. Some people have, you know, the right ideas about these, some people have wrong-headed notions. Um, you know, there's some people that are really, really touchy and they, they get upset about everything. That's because they see everything as irrational. They see it as, you know, unendurable, as something that they, they shouldn't have to put up with, as maybe directed at, at them, as not making sense. Um, when, when people see that something is rational, they're much more willing to put up with it, even if it's not fun or they, they don't enjoy it. Um, and he's got this great example here, he says, um, for this reason we need discipline in order to learn how to adapt the preconception of the rational and the irrational. But our preconceptions can be good or bad. They can be um, well put together or you know, all over the map and sort of disorganized. Uh, to the several things conformably to nature. In order to determine the rational and the irrational, we use not only the external thing. So we get into situations, right? We experience things. Whether it's rational or irrational to us depends partly on that stuff. But we consider also what is appropriate to each person. So what may work, what may be rational for one person may not be rational for another. And this is where you know, their duties may come in. Or also, in this example that he's got, which is kind of a crude example, but it's also kind of a funny example, um, it's what you value. He says, for one man it's consistent with reason to hold a chamber pot for another and to look to this only, that if he doesn't hold it, he will receive stripes, he's going to be beaten, and he will not receive his food. But if he holds the pot, he will not suffer anything hard or disagreeable. Uh, but to another man, not only does the holding of the chamber pot appear intolerable for himself, but intolerable also for him to allow another to do this office for him. What's a chamber pot? Everyone know what a chamber pot is? It's like a toilet, except it doesn't flush. Right? Uh, in, in before we had flush toilets, and before it came up with latrines and stuff like that, you would do your business in a chamber pot in your chamber, in your, in your room, and then you'd go dump it out somewhere. And um, most people don't like dealing with that sort of thing, just like most people don't like you know, changing diapers. But, you know, why do we change diapers? Because they're not going to change themselves. Babies don't change their own diapers, right? Um, but you would think that most people could take care of their own chamber pot business, right? But people don't generally like to. So if you can get somebody else to do it, and you know, who, who did this in ancient times? Why is he talking about not getting food and, and, and stripes? These are mainly servants or slaves. And you'd say, well, you know, it's unfortunate, but you're in the one down position. So you're going to handle this, this you know, unpleasant business for me. And if you don't do it, then I'm going to um, punish you. Now, it makes sense if food or not getting beaten is really the, the be all and end all. It makes perfect sense, like Epictetus says, hold the chamber. You know, if, if getting, you know, uh, three square meals a day 
because that's the be-all and end-all, you'll do pretty much anything for that, right? Um, for some people, they say, that's not for me. Uh, that's below my dignity. I'm not going to hold some chamber pot for somebody. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to insist that anybody else hold it for me. That's a different kind of approach to things. And they're both different ways of seeing, of using this to think about what's, what's rational. So he says, um, if you ask me whether you should hold the chamber pot or not, he says, you got to figure that out. You have to, he says, I, I say to you uh, that the receiving of food is worth more than the not receiving of it. Being scourged is a greater indignity than not being scourged. If you measure your interest by these things, if that's your choice about how you arrange your desires, that is a choice. If that's where you are, then it makes perfect sense to hold the chamber pot. It makes perfect sense to um, be somebody's valet and shine their boots and make all their appointments and do any of these sort of things that other people might find demeaning. Yeah? Doesn't that kind of like make us like the dog then? Do this, bad, you don't get to eat, do it, you get to eat, kind of deal. Yeah. Now notice, you ask, doesn't that make us like the dog. The person themselves chooses to be like the dog. Okay. Um, you know, we can think of all sorts of other things. You know, people often phrase these these uh, sort of moral dilemmas. Would you, um, let's say you were married. You know, they had that movie, what was it called? The Proposal, I think it was, where um, somebody says, I'll give you a million dollars if I can sleep with your spouse. Just one minute. You'd have to think about it, right? A million dollars is an awful lot of money. Now, if they only said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if I can sleep with your spouse, um, odds are you'd probably say, you're crazy, right? I mean, if you actually say, if somebody says, I'll give you a hundred bucks to sleep with your spouse, and they say, sounds good to me, you're probably, you, you've got a, a, you know, some sort of problem there. Right? <laughs> um, but a million bucks. Now, it's, now some people would actually think about it, wouldn't they? Uh, the question is, which do you value more? Your spouse and, and the relationship that you have with them, or the million dollars? Which do you, do you value? That's, that's a matter of your choices, isn't it? And, and Epictetus says, hey, I, I can't tell you. I can tell you what you ought to choose, but I can't tell you what you actually do choose. You have to actually look at that yourself. So he says, um, if you measure your interest by these things, go and hold the chamber pot. And he says, but this would not be worthy of me. Well, then it's you who must introduce this consideration into the inquiry, not I. For you know yourself, how much you are worth to yourself, and at what price you sell them, you, you will sell yourself. For men sell themselves at various prices. You know, what, what goods would you sort of sell yourself or give yourself over to somebody else? Four. You know, if you think about the chamber pot, um, where do people still do this sort of thing? Hospitals, right? We call it a bed payment. Somebody's got to do it. Um, that might be a different situation. It might be, you know, instead of being somebody's uh, <coughs> servant, like let's say they would pay you. Um, somebody would pay you. Say nice salary, like, like five thousand a month, you know? uh, and really all you have to do is be their, their chamber pot carrier and dump it out. That's all you got to do. The rest of the, the rest of the days, you're, you you got to be on call. You know, you never know when, when uh, nature's going to take its course. Um, well, you know, if that would be a, an attractive prospect for you, then you value that that five thousand bucks a month more than you value uh, the indignity. Of but why might you actually empty somebody's chamber pot or bedpan in a hospital? Because they can't take care of themselves and you love them. Why would you change somebody's diapers? Because you love them and you need to take care of them because they can't change it themselves. It's a different value there, isn't it? It's a different good. And it could be rational to change somebody's diapers, but not rational to an answer the, you know, whatever, You're probably like on Craigslist or something. Craigslist advertisement for the chamber pot valet. Um, you see the difference there, right? 
and this is a very silly example, but you could you could transpose this into just about anything. That that's Epictetus's point. You have to think about your own structure of motivation. You have to think about what matters to you. What, what you would order highest, what you would order lower. And the Stoics think that you ought to order some things highest and other things you really shouldn't care that much about. So this goes to, um, you know, at the beginning of the, the Enchiridion, he talks about what is actually in our power. What do we actually have um, control over? And what, what do we have control over? This is probably a pretty good list. Um, let me add one other one. Um, do you care about what people think of you? Anybody here care about what people think? I know I do. Um, so let's call that reputation. So these things are, are valuable to you. Now let's look at it the way a Stoic would. Um, and let's look at it through this lens of what's in our power, what's, in, what's not in our power, what's in our control, what's not in our control. So he says some things are in our control, others not. Things in our control are opinion, pursuit, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever are our own actions, whatever is our own concern. Um, that doesn't sound that much like these things, does it? But desires, aversions, those have to do with these things. These are all desired things, aren't they? You, you want money, that means you desire money. Um, you want to watch baseball or play baseball, that means that you, you desire that. Aversions would be the things that aren't on this list probably, or if there's some things on this list you really don't like, like uh, some people, probably not anybody in this class, but some people hate having freedom. They, they'd rather have everybody decide everything for them because uh, they're kind of afraid of freedom. That would be an aversion, right? Um, what are you averse to? Pain, I imagine, hope, because otherwise uh, you're probably going to screw up your body if you're not averse to pain. Right? Pain tells you quit doing that. Um, what else are you averse to? Maybe the loss of some of these things. Somebody takes your freedom away, um, makes it impossible for you to experience pleasure, ruins your reputation. You would be averse to that, right? Um, you also have control over what you think. That's what opinion means, how you, how you view things. Um, and he says, the things that are in our control are by nature free, unrestrained, unhindered. Those, in our control, those not in our control are weak, slavish, restrained, belonging to others. Um, other people have control over some of the goods that we do, in fact, desire. That's part of the, the message of Stoicism. That's, that's one of the starting points. Um, and he says, remember, that if you suppose that things that are slavish by nature are also free, and that what belongs to others is your own, you're going to be hindered. You will lament. You will be disturbed. You will find fault with both gods and men. But if you suppose that only to be your own, which actually is your own, and you leave others to have theirs, you're going to have a happy life. As he says, you will never do anything against your will. No one will hurt you. Um, so what actually are the things that, that you don't have control over? Um, well, let, let's use one example right here. You do want people to think of you in a certain way, right? Uh, you do regard that as a good. Other moral theorists that we're going to look at, like say Aristotle, they think that's a good too. Um, is it really genuinely a good for somebody like Epictetus well, do you have control over your reputation? You do to some extent, right? You can you can choose to screw it up. Like if you know if you do something crazy or underhanded or corrupt. Um, but even if you do the right thing, you guys have all probably experienced this. You can do the right thing. Does that dictate how other people are going to see you? What they're going to say about you? How can things go wrong? How have they gone, gone wrong in, in, in your experience? You don't have to use yourself, think about other people. Yeah? Well, like, I guess if you do something, it could be like misinterpreted like the wrong way. So that person could like see you doing something that wasn't
wasn't your actual intention? Yeah, one of, one of the most common experiences in life, I think, in, in, in shared life together, is being at cross purposes, doing something that's, that you think is good, and the other person thinks you're you know, trying to take control over them, or you're only after money, or something like that. Um, how does it go when you try to explain yourself? Yeah, there, you, you, again, you don't have control over even whether you can fix things. The other person has control over that. If somebody wants to be an obstinate ass, they can be an obstinate ass. And there's really very little you can do about that. I mean, you can try to punish them and, and you know, yell at them and berate them and call them names, but how, how productive is that? I think that you all probably tried that one time or another, right? When somebody's tried doing that with you, what's your natural reaction? Somebody starts saying, you shouldn't see things this way. You should see it this way, because that will make me look better. How do you react? Do you generally comply? You might actually like, you know, give them sort of lip service and say, yeah, yeah, I understand your point of view. Sure, whatever. You know, I think you're a great person. And then you're walking away. You're like, that jackass. You know, because you, you weren't convinced that really what they want Reputation exists in other people's eyes. If, if what that person wants is their reputation to be of a certain sort, they're kind of setting themselves up for um, disappointment, aren't they? As a matter of fact, a lot of these, these things are out of your control. You, you have some degree of control, like you can lay the groundwork for a successful job. But, um, well, here, here's a sort of sad example right now. The job market is pretty bad, right? Um, it's unfortunate for you guys because you're close to getting out of college and, and things don't look very great. Um, so you might think, well, I should go to graduate school. Um, you know, we'll, we'll extend it another couple more years and I'll get a master's and maybe a PhD and then I'll get a job for sure, right? Well, not really. I mean, in, in my field in philosophy, for every job that I apply for, there's 300 applicants on average. And then, you know, they write you back these letters and say, I'm sorry we didn't, you know, we, we didn't hire you. There were 323 applicants in the search, so don't feel bad. And, and you know, you, you, can, you can use that. You can say, well, I, I guess I shouldn't feel bad. You know, there's so many. How could I possibly have gotten this, you know, like, like rolling the dice and, and getting sevens every time? But, you know, you still feel a bit down about that, right? Why wasn't I the one? Well, because the world doesn't revolve around you, right? Um, you're just one bit of, of it. And so if you go and you get a PhD in a field which is highly competitive and there's already a lot of other people in the field that aren't retiring and there's not a lot of jobs opening up and they're actually, in some places, closing philosophy departments. Um, and you're going to be a, you're going to be successful at your job. You're actually laying yourself in for not probably just a potentiality, but a probability of being disappointed, of being upset. Um, and I, I know a lot of friends who go from job to job to job, just teaching you know one year here, two years here, or teaching like I am right now as an adjunct. Um, and uh, no, it's not a great prospect. Um, I mean, you, I hope all of you do have a successful job. I hope that you do everything that you can. I know Maris is, is very good about placement and internships and all that, so that will help balance it out a bit. But it is it is pretty tough. You don't have a lot of control over this. Um, bless you. Thank you. Friends and family. Um, family, right off the bat, you don't actually have that much control over. You've all heard the expression, uh, you can pick your friends, but you what? You can't pick your family. Um, don't say that to your family because then they might, you know, feel bad. Uh, they'll, they'll take it as, you know, a, a slur against them. But you actually don't pick your family, at least like the family that you grew up with. Do you? They may have picked you. You might, like I am, for example, be adopted. Um, but I didn't have any, any stake in it. 
I mean, there could be some situations where, like, you're a philosopher kid and say, I don't want to be with these people. Can I please go find some other place? But then they just assign you another foster family. I knew some guys when I was in the prison who had five or six foster families, and none of them were a good fit. The next one was, was worse than the one after that. Even your friends. Um, you don't have entire control over whether your friends are going to remain friendly with you, do you? So if, if your happiness depends on having these sort of things, you may be laying yourself in for unhappiness. What about health? Do you have control over that? Again, to some degree. If you don't exercise, you're definitely not going to be healthy. If you eat whatever you want all the time, you're not going to be healthy. But can you do all those sort of things and still not, still not be healthy? Yeah, unfortunately. There's, there's people who, you know, run every day and they eat a, you know, uh, low-fat, low-sodium diet and they die of a heart attack at 40. Um, and then, you know, you look at them and you say, wow, that guy could have been indulging himself all this time. He missed out. Um, because when it comes down to it, a lot of these, these things are not actually all that reliable. They're not within our power. Uh, Epictetus thinks that this is, though, freedom. I think he would also say that knowledge, at least you know, if, if, if by knowledge we mean something like the way you ought to live your life, is within our power. It might not be within your power if you mean something like um, access to the library over there that we have at, at Marist. You know, we, we take that sort of stuff for granted. Um, I have a friend, or actually a colleague, who is involved in a project to deliver um, a whole bunch of uh, USB drives, you know, little thumb drives, to Africa. And um, the reason why he's doing that is because nowadays, if you want a book, you could just put a whole bunch of them on a USB drive, right? There's not an awful lot of books in, in a lot of parts of Africa, but there are, uh, strangely enough, more and more computers or, you know, terminals of some sort that you could actually um, put a whole bunch of PDF files onto and access it there. We take that sort of stuff for granted, but there's a lot of places where knowledge is pretty hard to come by. Um, so you might not have that much control over, over that. So um, what are other things that you don't have control over? Um, well, a lot of the things that we're averse to. So, you know, reputation is something we want, that's something we desire. What's something we're averse to? Um, pain, poverty. Uh, Ep Epictetus says, ultimately, you can't control whether, say, the market ruins you or not. I, I know people who you know, were set to retire uh, five years ago, and suddenly they lost three quarters of the value of their, their retirement fund. Now they're still working. Um, disease, I mean, again, if you if you wash your hands, you're probably less likely to get diseases, right? If you take care of yourself, you're probably less likely. But could you still die of some, some sort of terrible disease? Could you catch something that you don't really have any control over? I mean, why do people not like to go to hospitals? Other than, you know, hospital food is usually pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what do you mean? You're like, if all the sick people go, so there's got to be something going on over there. Yeah, I mean, what are the what are the sort of things people actually get? I mean, sometimes somebody will come into the hospital with some minor thing, and then they die. What happened? They get a flesh-eating bacteria, um, you know, MRSA. Um, you can get some some uh, disease or uh, uh, pet, uh, what do they call it? Antibiotic-resistant strain of, of a disease, um, and generally. The, the sick people are there in the hospital. You can get a staph infection. Um, a lot of people get, get pneumonia in hospitals. You don't have much control over that. I suppose, you know, if you have a lot of money, you could, like, you know, request a good hospital and, you know, keep everybody else out of your wing. But that depends on you having a lot of money. You have an awful lot of control over that either. Not much. So stoicism is, is in large part saying you don't have control over a lot of uh, the things that you do. Um, what do 
you actually have control over? Like he said, what you think or opinion. He'll also talk at other places about um, dogma or things like that. These are all ways of talking about what it is that you believe, what it is that you think about things, your attitude that you take towards things. Um, you have control, interestingly enough, over what you desire and what you're averse to. Um, let me say that one more time, because that's kind of a, a revolutionary thing to say in our society. And it wasn't in Greek society, too. You have control over what you desire. Not just over what you do, over what you actually desire, what you think are good things, and what you think are bad things, what you are averse to. Um, you can choose to see something one way or the other. Not just mentally, not just cognitively, but affectively or emotionally. So, somebody insulting you, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does it make you feel good or make you feel bad? Feel bad. Yeah. You know, why? You're averse to it, right? It's something you don't like. You see it as, as a as an evil or as a bad. Um, from Epictetus' point of view, somebody insulting you is really neither a bad thing nor a good thing. What makes it a bad thing for you? You choose to see it that way <coughs> on some level. You are invested in seeing it that way. Some other, things, one second, some other things that you are seeing as good or bad things make you see things that way. <coughs> Hmm. Yeah, you don't, he's not, when he says that it's neither a good thing nor a bad thing, he's not saying it's a good thing. He's not saying you should go out and try to get insulted. He's saying we think of being insulted as a bad thing. It's really neither good nor bad. Um, what, what we do have control over is how we see it. And he, he actually says, you know, when somebody wrongs another person, like, you know, they behave in an insulting manner. Where is the, the harm? It's not actually in what the other person is doing. It's in one's attitude towards that. So if you can change that attitude towards that so that you don't see it as a bad thing, so you see it as just, just a thing, you know, just what it is, um, then you're actually going to be happier, aren't you? Because you're not going to be negatively affected by it. You're not going to be hurt. Um, why, why are you hurt by people insulting you? Because you care about it. If you're a Stoic, ideally, you want to get to the point where you, you don't care about that, that sort of thing. And there's, you know, there's different ways of not caring. Some people say, oh, I don't care. And you can tell that really deep down inside, they do. They just sort of push it all down and they don't react. That's not what Stoicism is, is advocating. It's advocating actually changing the way in which you think about things and by doing that, the way that you feel about it. Um, in, in that, it's very similar to a type of um, psychotherapy called cognitive behavior therapy. Or sometimes it's called rational emotive therapy. <coughs> um, there's a few other words for it. That actually had its start this century in people who had studied stoicism. And one of the insights of cognitive behavior therapy is that we have control over our emotions. We have control over how we see things. Not just, you know, they're not just imposed on us. They're not just there and then we have to react to them. We actually have some choice in it. We have some responsibility. And that gives us some freedom. Because, you know, if you're, say, an angry person, why, why do people get angry in the first place? Think about that. Why, why have you gotten angry, say, in the last week? I'm willing to bet every one of you has gotten angry at one point or another in the last week. I'm not looking for this specific example of, you know, well, first she, he said this, and then I said that, and then this person said that. What sort of things get you angry? Yeah. Tension with my housemate. Okay. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? Tension over, over what? Or what? how does that look? Space, really. Okay. Somebody else is in your space? Or they feel you're in their space? And then you get into an art. You can get into an argument about whose space it is. It's common space, and you can throw all these sort of things in, and then it can escalate. Yeah. What's, what's going on there? 
why, why does that get you upset or angry? Why does that get the other person upset or angry too? Well, I think it's because we both sometimes feel that we need to be alone, but we're in too close quarters for it. Okay, yeah, I can understand that. I've been in many situations like that. So you have, you have a desire that can't be met. And, and who's interfering with your desire? That other person, right? Uh, and then the same thing's happening with you. And they're, maybe they're telling you, hey, why don't you go somewhere else? And then maybe that hurts your feelings, right? Yeah. You say, well, if you were hanging around the house all the time, now well, their feelings are hurt too, right? And where is all this coming from? It's because of what we desire and what we're averse to. We don't like other people telling us what to do. That's something we're averse to because we see that as a bad thing. Um, we want to be valued by other people. Other people tell us, you know, you're in my space. We feel like we're not being valued, right? Uh, when other people are impinging on our space, we feel like they don't value us, right? And we see these as good or bad things, but we have a choice about that. Where are you, where are you I was going to say just that you feel wrong in some like, way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's, that's the ultimate cause of, of feeling angry, that we feel that the other person has not just hurt us, They've wronged us. They've done something that they shouldn't have done, that they didn't have a right to do. Um, well, why do we have that sort of viewpoint? Again, because we haven't managed to disentangle ourselves from all these things out in the world, or even having to do with our own body, or our own feelings that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, what, what do we actually have control over? How we see things. What we choose to center our, our life around. Um, Epictetus talks about, uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to talk about this more in, in the next class session, so I'm going to use somewhat different material and we'll stitch these together. He talks about the human being as being different from animals in one key way. And it's not that we associate in cities or you know play music or things like that. It's that we have uh, a part of us that's rational what he calls the ruling part. Um, animals don't have reason, or at least they don't have it in the way that we do. You know, you can debate about do, do dolphins or monkeys or, not monkeys, chimps, uh, apes, have, have reason, um, and the verdict is still kind of out. Certainly they don't have it the way that we do. They're not taking ethics classes, right? As far as we know. Um, no dolphin has a registrar that is signed up down, down below the sea. Um, we do have reason. We have this part of ourselves that can reflect on the world, can reflect on other people, can reflect on our body and our desires, can reflect on itself. And it can actually take a stand, not just in, in seeing these things, but it can judge them. It can judge whether it's doing a good job or a poor job. Other things can't. So, you know, Epictetus, for example, talks about um, the art of carpentry can tell you a lot about carpentry. Can tell you when you want to use carpentry. No. Um, can I tell you about anything other than carpentry? Afraid not. Can I tell you whether the carpenter is a good person or a bad person? No. What about your, your desires and your emotions? Anger can tell you something. Hey, that person's a jerk. I should do something to hurt them in response. That's what it tells you, right? Um, can anger actually step back and look at itself and say, wow, this is really over the top. Maybe I shouldn't do this. We, we talked about this a little bit with Plato, right? Um, Thumos, or the spirited part of your soul, can't actually back up and look at itself and say, um, maybe I shouldn't be so angry about this. As a matter of fact, what does anger tell you when you've all, you know, you've all been angry, what does anger actually tell you when you start having thoughts of, maybe I'm going too far with this? What does that drive tell you? You've all been in the grip of anger, right? No, 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 this is, this is exactly what you should be doing. As a matter of fact, you should be doing more. They really deserve it. Say another bad thing. If they said two bad things to you, say five to them. That'll show them. Have you ever had that sort of 
reasoning going on in your head? That you made choices based on that? No? And you're a much better person than I am. <laughs> Um, I use anger a lot as an example in these classes, in part because I've actually, myself, you know, over the last 40 years had to struggle with it a lot and made some progress, but not, not as much as I ought to have made. As far as Epictetus and Stoicism is concerned, the only thing you can really rely on <coughs> is this itself, the value of having your moral purpose in accordance with nature. Um, later on in the, uh, the discourses, he says, what is the nature of the good? Um, he says, um, what is the nature of the good? Flesh, certainly not. An estate and land, by no means fame. No, is it intelligence, knowledge, right reason? <coughs> yes. Herein, then, simply seek the nature of the good. For I suppose you don't seek it in a plant. No. Do you seek it in an irrational animal? No. If you then seek it in a rational animal, why do you seek it anywhere except in the superiority of rational over irrational creatures, where we differ? This is where, according to Stoicism, our good truly lies. Um, and he actually talks in, in some sort of. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to by bringing this up, put you in, in mind of um, sort of religious people that we think about today. The Stoics had a certain kind of religion, but it was, it was very pantheistic. It says, you're a superior being. You're a portion separated from the deity. You have in yourself a certain portion of him. Why, then, are you ignorant of your own noble descent? Will you not remember when you're eating who you are, uh, who you are, who eat, and whom you feed? Um, when you're in social intercourse, when you're exercising yourself, when you're engaged in discussion, know you not that you are nourishing a God, that you are exercising a God. You're carrying a God around with you. You're carrying around something extremely valuable with you. And what are you doing with it, he would say? You're probably selling, you know, if you're like me, actually, I'm not a very good stoic. You're probably selling this out for other things. You, you've got a skewed way of, of valuing. So if that's the case, then we'd want to think about how we would change that. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll do that in um, just a minute. Before we do that, I want, I want to think about um, a few examples that would, would fit in here with Epictetus. Um, one that um, I'll tell you about from my own work. When I first started teaching, I was kind of a hothead. And I got angry at students quite often. I was dissatisfied with their performance, with what went on in the classroom. I would let it upset me. Um, this, and actually, my first job, as you know, my first full-time teaching job was teaching in a maximum security prison. And so you've got you know, murderers and um, rapists and kidnappers. And they're, they're in my classes. And one of the things they, they actually got a kick out of is when I would like blow up and yell at a student. And they would, they, you know, they would like sit back and some of them got <coughs> a charge out of that. They, you know, they could see my ears turning red first. And they knew after a while which things were, were setting up. They asking certain questions. Do we have to read this? You know? Um, now why would something like that set me off? Well, because of certain assumptions I was making. Um, it wasn't just a matter of my emotions. Your emotions don't get engaged unless you have corresponding thoughts or assumptions. Um, and these have to do with the nature of, of what's good and what's bad. I mean, I expected that every student should be just as interested in the stuff that I'm teaching as I am in reading it, studying it, talking about it, all that. Is that a realistic assumption? No? Any of you disagree? 
I mean, do you think it's a realistic assumption? Some other teachers believe that. Yeah, well, they're probably, you know, going to have a hard time. <laughs> I certainly had a hard time myself. Um, there's a lot of other assumptions built into it as well, but I think that was part of it is that, hey, this is really valuable stuff. This is great things. You should want this. You should, you know, see this as a good for yourself. You should behave like people who see it that way, not try to cut corners or, you know, do the other, all the other things that students do, right? I mean, I remember what it was like to be a student. I didn't read everything that was assigned to me either. I read what I felt like reading, you know? <laughs> Suddenly I forget that when I'm a professor, you know, because now I have a different, different role. This is, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of different thoughts and assumptions going on there, uh, a lot of different emotions. And what do, what do all this lead to? They lead to reactions. I would actually blow up at students. Do you think that made things better? It, you know, if I yell at, at some student, is that going to make them want to do the right thing and recognize the value of, of you know, because the stuff that I was teaching was valuable. Is that going to help the student realize the value of it? I'm going to say, you know, that's what jerks like. Now I know I don't want to study that stuff. Because I don't want to be a jerk like you. You know, something along those lines. Um, so it leads to counterproductive actions. And these end up becoming habits. Habits that are not only of actions, but also of ways of thinking about things. So the next time I go into that classroom, how am I thinking about those students? These dummies probably didn't do the reading. That's an assumption. There's a huge value judgment there, right? Is that going to help things coming in with, with a, an assumption like that? That's going to actually screw things up more. And that's going to be a reflection of my emotional state. And all of these things are going to feed into <coughs> Um, and what's the one thing that you notice isn't in there that's really important if you want to start to take control of this? Reason, rationality. Well, that's actually going to come in here. Um, and, and that's going to bring up an interesting point. So let me defer that for just a second. Um, what else? Choice. Choice. I had a choice in how I looked at these things. I had a choice in whether I allowed my desires for a genuine good, good of learning, to be skewed in this way is to make me angry with students. I had, a, I had a choice about what I did with my anger. I had a choice in my actions. And I also had a choice, although not quite so directly, about uh, habits, didn't I? Epictetus says something really interesting. This is a little bit later in the uh, discourses. And I, I want to read this, this passage to you. Because uh, it has to do with um, has to do with habits. Um, this is this chapter eighteen, deep in the discourses. He says, every habit and faculty, so even reason itself, every habit and faculty is maintained and increased by the corresponding actions. The habit of walking by walking, the habit of running by running. If you would be a good reader, read. Uh, if a writer, write. But it, it, when you have not read 30 days in succession, but have done something else, you'll know the consequence. You guys, you've all experienced that. You go on break, quit reading stuff. Now when you come back to it, it's a little bit harder, isn't it? Um, and he says, in the same way, if you've lain down 10 days, get up and attempt to make a long walk. You'll see how your legs are, are weakened. So if you would make anything a habit, do it. If you would not make it a habit, don't do it, but accustom yourself to do something else. It's the same way, he says, with the affections of the soul. When you've been angry, you must know that not only has this evil befallen you, being angry is not pleasant, is it? I mean, some people actually get addicted to it. Then I guess it could be pleasant. But is it pleasant overall? And then, you know, a lot of times the consequences aren't pleasant either, right? You do things and then afterwards you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Um, yeah. I finally, the, a lot of the works that we've been studying kind of relate to one another back and forth, like McIntyre and his uh, idea in regards to your narrative and the choices that you make, and if you continue to make a bad choice, you're going to lead down that path. And as you're yeah. talking about habits, it's kind of like 
almost the same thing. Yeah, and some of the other people that we're going to see this semester are going to talk about habits as well, and, and choices and habits and how they feed into each other. So he says, um, when you're angry, you must know that not only has this evil befallen you in the moment, you've also increased the habit. And then a man had thrown fuel on the fire. So every time that you allow yourself to become angry, respond in anger, keep thinking those angry thoughts that reinforce the anger, you're strengthening the habit of getting angry in these sort of situations. Right? Um, if you want to break the habit, you actually have to make a choice, one which doesn't change things all the time, does it? When you're trying to change a habit, can you change a habit? Just by saying, oh, I'm not going to be an angry person anymore. Or I'm not going to be a fearful person. Or I'm not going to be, uh, you, you know, think about just uh, cognitive things that have to do with this. I don't, I don't like this person, although I don't have any good reasons not to, not to like them because they're a nice person. Um, but I just don't like them. If you decide to change your mindset towards them, does it happen immediately, overnight? What do you have to do? So do it, say that again? Do it every day. Keep doing it every day. Somebody else had something? Progress. Progress. Uh, Start liking yourself because the fact that you don't like something in, your, in yourself is why you're probably hating. You might have to do person. something. It's the assumption of it's basically. Yeah, you might have to do some, some introspection with it. Um, and with progress, you want to actually like, figure out, am I making progress? You want to look at yourself every so often. Um, and you gotta, you got to keep at it. You have to make a choice to keep making that kind of choice. But you can do that, because that's what our faculty of choice allows us to do. And if you don't choose to do that, if you choose something, you know, to like say, eh, I'll try it this one time, and then you say, eh, that didn't work for me, um, and you say, I guess I just have to dislike this person. That was your choice, right? You chose to say, I'm not really going to change this habit. I'm just going to dilettantishly play around with it. Now, now, when it comes to reason, so I wanted to come back to this. Epictetus thinks that our faculty of reason is not infallible. It's screwed up. And part of what we have to do is actually use our choices to slowly strip away wrong-headed assumptions that we probably have about this or that. Like, you know, I, I think that um, if I was a, a good Stoic, I would realize that I probably should be exercising a lot more regularly than I, I'm doing because I'm 40 years old and, you know, I want to live to be about 80. And if I want that to happen, I certainly can't, you know, stay at this weight and not exercise. Um, why am I doing that? Well, in part, I don't like exercising anymore. I used to, but that's not my desire. I have an aversion towards it now. And I, I want to do other things instead. Like, you know, I'd rather read books and, you know, hang out and watch TV and make, make you know, fattening food. <coughs> so you have to cut. Uh, and those are habits. And those are reactions. Well, some of it has to do with my mindset. If I would actually get straight in my mind about the real values of things, it would make it an awful lot easier for me to feel the right way, to do the right thing, and that would change those habits, wouldn't it? So our faculty of reason has to be developed, has to be purified. It's, it's not an automatically reliable guide. So he says, he says this with other things, too. Um, he talks about this with, with, with um, uh, sexual desire. When you have been overcome in sexual intercourse with a person, like, you know, you sleep with somebody that you didn't intend to sleep with when you went out, uh, but by the end of the night, you know, you decide to hook up, and then the next morning you say, oh, this is stupid. Why did I do that? He says, don't reckon this a single defeat. Reckon you've also nurtured, increased your incontinence or your lack of moderation, your lack of control over your desires. He says, in this matter, certainly as philosophers say, diseases of the mind grow up. Once you've desired money, if reason be applied to lead to a perception of the evil, the desire is stopped. And the ruling faculty of our mind is restored to original authority. So that's very fancy language for saying, um, you know, think about how you value things. If you start to value money as, as you normally do, you can actually stop yourself and say, well, wait a minute, money's good, but this stuff is better. But if you don't do that, what's going to happen? 
you're going to start to say, yeah, money's really good. I, I really need to have money. It needs to be higher than, than these other things. Uh, he says, um, He says, something of the kind happens with diseases of the soul. Certain traces and blisters are left in it. Unless a man shall complete, completely efface them when he is lashed on the same places, the lash will produce not blisters but sores. If then you wish not to be of an angry temper, don't feed the habit. Throw nothing on it which will increase it. At first, keep quiet. So that's, that's behavior, right? Does that change how you feel? Not, not right at the start. But you, you have a choice. When you're angry, do you have to insult somebody? Or, you know, do something else? No. Uh, don't feed the habit. Don't think angry thoughts. I mean, you've all been angry, and you know what it's like when you're, you're, you know, you're angry and you're arguing with somebody, and then like you say, I can't talk with you, and you like, walk off, and you're thinking to themselves, that person is such a jerk. They're always coming down on me. They don't respect me. You know, you're saying all these things to yourself, right? You know, that reminds me of the time that they did this and that. Wow, now I, I, I start to see a larger pattern there. They do this and this and this and this. They don't like me at all. They're not really my friend. And you start, now you, you really wound yourself up, right? And if you do that, that will um, augment those emotions. Go ahead. Yeah, I know this isn't what stoicism is, but like, it seems, seems selfish in terms of the cycle. Instead of thinking of the actions uh -huh. and what their consequences are, you're thinking of actions and how they create habits in yourself. So if you really like to draw a line from actions to like the right and have it be consequences, I think if you thought about the consequences you're acting on emotions as, it'd be a lot easier to make the right choice instead of thinking of creating habits. Because if you just make that one right choice, yeah, that becomes a habit in itself. Instead of thinking of not creating a bad habit, yeah, think about or not feeding a bad habit. Yeah, right. think about doing the right thing. Sure. Yeah, that that, that adds some some more stuff to the picture. Um, and, and you know, Epictetus does. You know, the consequence that he thinks about mainly is this is screwing you up. Yeah. Um, not like you know, this is keeping you from having a good business deal or, or anything like that. <coughs> I think you're right. Um, that would be a very useful way of, if you wanted to change your habits through choices, thinking about the, the likely consequences or, or the consequences that you've actually experienced. I don't want to do this again because then this happens. Would be a good way to do it. Epictetus gives you a lot of examples, like when you go to the bathhouse, um, you know. Don't, don't get upset when somebody splashes you because that's what happens at bathhouses. Um, how many of you go to bathhouses? Not too many. I mean, that was a big thing back in, in Greco-Roman times. Um, you know, nowadays we associate it with, with sort of um, uh, homosexuality and things like that. But it wasn't, the bathhouses back then were just places where people went and they socialized and got massages and took baths. They had like hot baths and cold baths and and, and you know, you'd go, but it was like, have any of you ever gone to the public pool? Do they have a public pool here in Poughkeepsie? I don't know. What's it like in the public pool? As opposed to somebody somebody's home pool? It's a lot. What's that? It's like there's just more people. Like yeah, it's noisy, right? Um, and you gotta watch where you put your stuff because somebody might steal your stuff. Um, that's why it's good to go in with a bunch of people. And then, like, you know, this group will stake out this spot in the pool as their spot. And these are all the inconveniences that you put up with, right? So you, you can probably relate to that. Or when you go to the movie theater. How many of you go, still go see movies in the theater? Everyone's oh, quite a few of you. Okay. Um, first off, what's, the, what's your biggest complaint about going to the movie theater? Yeah. Price. Yeah. I mean, it's astronomical how much you have to pay to go to the movie theater. Um, when I was a kid, there was a place that we could go for a buck. You know? And granted, they were older, you know, there were movies that like, had been shown for like a couple months or so. But we could go for a buck. You know? And then they started jacking it up further and further and further. And I took my kids to the movie theater. Um, 
to see the Chipmunks movie recently. We must have dumped like a hundred bucks between popcorn and candy and sodas and you know, the tickets themselves and, and you know now they actually have like a bistro in the movie theater and you get your Starbucks coffee there too. And, um, okay, so the price. What else? What else ruins your theater going experience sometimes? Yeah. Cell phones going off, yeah, uh, yeah. People who talk. Yeah, people who talk sometimes even give advice to the movie, you know. Um, yeah. I was going to say, when, like, you can't like, all sit with your group. Oh, like, because you know it's crowded. You can't always, like, sit together. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. I, when people keep their, like, their, their trash or their popcorn on the floor, you know, like, watching them, like, popcorn and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we were awful kids when I was a kid. We used to like sit in the back and we'd buy things and we, we could throw. We must have made it hell for people in the movie theater. Can you imagine that? You're in the movie theater and you try to watch some movie and some, some kid in the back is throwing like, you know, uh, malted milk balls or popcorn or something like that. Okay, so if you go to the movie theater, these are all the sort of things that are going to happen. So what are you going to do when they happen? I mean, you have a choice. If you were a stoic, you could say, uh, I came here to have a really good time and not to be bothered by anybody. Is that going to be productive? What, what, is, what is your reaction going to be like that? You're going to be mad or you're going to be depressed or something like that. Um, what if you tell yourself, I came here with the intention of keeping my faculty of choice or moral purpose in accordance with nature? That's my primary good. Now, this sounds very artificial, right? But you would do this in a certain, you would make this part of your habit. If you tell yourself, I didn't actually come here just to have a good time. If that happens, that's great. But I came here trying to do the same thing as I do everywhere else in life, trying to keep my cool, trying to keep it together, trying to make some progress in life. Then when somebody throws, you know, somebody in the back, some, some jerk kid, throws a malted milk ball and hits you in the back of the head, how are you going to react? A little bit differently, right? You, know, you, might, you might say, that's really, you know, this is the sort of thing that happens. It's unfortunate that it happened to me, but it's really just sort of luck of the draw. If I was sitting over this way, it would have been somebody else who got hit in the head. And it really got nothing to do with me personally. Um, it's not like the world is out to get me. It's not like this kid is out to, to ruin my theater going experience. This is just something that, that happened. And this is part of the, the price of, of going to the movie theater. Um, another example that, that um, I'd like you to think about is, let's say we talk about going out to eat. Right? All of you like to go out to eat, I think. Um, what are you looking for when you go out to eat? What makes it a good experience for you? Yeah. The food is good? Yeah. So, food is good. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment because we can probably break that down further. Uh, what else? Yeah. Service is good. Okay, so let's call it um, company. <coughs> company is good, and one aspect of that could be conversation. Um, that's probably enough to go on. So let's let's think about this a little bit more. So the food is good. What what goes into that? Okay. Um, by a good chef. Uh, yeah. Fresh food. Okay, so it's fresh. And all ingredients. You know, it's nothing worse than a salad where like the lettuce is fresh, but the, the avocado is brown and, and the tomato is kind of, you know, 
wilted and all right. Maybe you can tell the stuff's been in a cooler for a couple days. Um, what else goes into good food? Yeah. It's made out of one. Oh, okay. My uncle Aim tells a story over and over again. When they were kids, they never went out to eat because they were they were poor. My family was lower middle class, and they would drive up to, to Canada from Chicago um, to go see you know their relatives, and uh, they would stop at a restaurant. That was a big treat. They'd eat somewhere other than mom's kitchen, and grandpa would make them order all the same fish because his theory was. The cook will only be cooking one kind of dish. It'll come out quicker. We can get on the road because he had to drive a little bit. But of course, you know, if you know anything about the restaurant business, that, that, there's no logic there at all. Um, you know, you, you, who knows how many people are cooking in the bag? And actually, the cook might actually be irritated that he has to make the same thing uh, over and over again. And it drove Uncle Lane nuts because he, you know, his, his thought was, you go to a restaurant so you can have what you want to eat. You don't have to eat the thing that 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 person next to you is eating. That was taken away from him because of because of that. Um, anything else? Maybe in, in food being good. You probably don't think about this that much, but if you start going to fancier and fancier places, there's something that they call presentation or plating, um, and that that's that's you know seen as important. What about good service? What does good service look like? Yeah, because sometimes they can make you feel like you don't belong, right? Um, yeah. They're attentive to like your table. Yeah, that's pretty important too. Um, you know, you want your water filled every so often. You know, you don't want to have to. Hey, come on over here. Uh, it's even worse when you have to like gesture another waiter or waitress or server to come over and and take care of your table. They're not usually happy about that. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, that's that's probably enough. Of the company. Could be conversation. Some people like to go and take a book along. You know, that's their conversation. Um, anything else that would make it a, a particularly good experience for you? Mm -hmm. Company. Can you think of anything that could make it a bad experience with company? Like they behave like jerks. You know, they're abusive to the waiter. Things like that. Um, okay, so with this experience of going out to eat, then let's think about it the way a stoic would. Is there anything wrong with going out to eat? I mean, if you're a stoic, could you go out to eat? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like you, you would lose your stoic credentials by having somebody else prepare food for you. But what are the things that can go wrong in these ways? Well, any one of these elements could be missing. Um, from the experience. Are you going to, now, when you have that experience, are you going to allow that to, to get to you? Well, I can think of one other thing that probably matters a lot. Um, <coughs> that we forgot about. Sanitation. Right? When you go into a restaurant, look for that health, health uh, inspection score. And if it's below, you know, the high 90s, you don't want to eat there. Um, because sanitation is very important. Um, but, you know, with all these other things, um, you have a choice whether you allow these things to get to you. <coughs> you can have desires for these, but realize when you have those desires, if you place your happiness in having a server who is attentive, you're probably going to have a bad day. I would say half the servers out there that I, I run across are not very attentive. Some of them are, are particularly, you know, but 
quite often they're not, because quite often they don't want to be there. Um, that might be a factor of where I eat. But, you know. um, so you get the general idea, right? The, the, the stoic approach to things is to focus on these things that I had up there before. Freedom. Freedom is a, is a primary good. A rational life, that's a primary good. Um, Stoicism is not only about, you know, becoming free, uh, being rational, it's also about doing your duties. This, here it's going to actually sort of prefigure Kant, who we're going to read a little bit later in the semester. Uh, and our duties, for Stoicism, are based on our roles, which are given to us, for the most part. Some of your roles you've chosen, like you, you, you are now students, right? You chose to become a student at one point. What are some of the things you don't have any control over that you're, you're, you're stuck into? What are some of the roles that you wrote down and had you think about that? Different roles that you are, you have as, as who you are. Yeah. So I'm a big brother. Okay. So a brother. Actually, the big brother is a somewhat different role than little brother, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Citizen. Citizen, yeah. You're, I guess you can sort of withdraw from that. I'm not going to vote ever. You know. <coughs> um, but you're stuck here anyway. You still have to pay taxes. Being a boyfriend takes up a lot of time. Okay. <laughs> Boy. <coughs> Actually, we'll put big brother or sister, boyfriend. Sometimes it does feel kind of onerous to be a son or daughter, or even to be a boyfriend or girlfriend, doesn't it? Being an RA is, is certainly no, no treat. Um, these are probably a, a good mix. Um, now, with any of these roles, you have certain duties that come with them, and you can do them well, or poorly, or, or not at all, right? Uh, whose choice is that? Now, a lot of that will depend on things like habits and your mindset and, and your emotions. Um, I think there would be certain frames of mind that would probably make somebody a bad boyfriend or girlfriend who would have a hard time fulfilling some of their duties. Like, what would be some of the what, what are some of the expectations of a good boyfriend or girlfriend? What do you want? Then? Yeah. Be faithful. Yeah, that's a big one right there. Right? Um, What's one other one? Care. We'll come back to that as a great example. What else should they do? Yeah. Nurturing. Nurturing, yeah. They should they should actually like you for who you are. <coughs> Maybe not just for your money or the fact that you know you have friends that they like or you do their homework for them. They actually do some nice things for you too, because they like you. So um, being faithful, could there be some, some habits or some desires or some, you know, frames of mind that would render a person much less likely to, to fulfill those duties of fidelity? I think so. If you're a sex addict, you're going to have a hard time being a good boyfriend or girlfriend, for one thing. That, that's a matter of habits, but that's also a matter of affection. This is an extreme case, right? But, um, that's a matter of your, your affective desires, and that's a matter of your, your mindset. Because the addict tells themselves, I can't, I can't stop it. But, you know, to some degree, that's a matter of choice. You, know, you can choose whether to place yourself in situations where you're going to feel tempted, or not choose, or choose not to place yourself there. Um, you can choose, as soon as you start getting tempted, to get out of there, or, or not to, right? Um, 
What about being a son or daughter? What should a good son or daughter do? Be obedient. I will say, you know, say things like kill yourself. Don't don't obey them, right? But uh, obedient to you know reasonable things. What else? Yeah. Helpful. Be helpful. Uh, what were you gonna say? I think you're gonna hit me. Be respectful. Yeah. These are these are important things. Now Epictetus asks you, and here's here's the what we're gonna leave off with. He's he's talking about brothers actually, and he says, "Does your brother wrong you? Is your brother a bad brother to you?" That could be the case, right? Do you have control over whether your brother is a good brother? Do you have control over whether your boyfriend or girlfriend is a good boyfriend or girlfriend? When you have kids, are you going to have control over whether they're good sons or daughters? I mean, there's ways you could definitely screw them up to make sure they're going to be bad sons and good daughters. There's ways you could screw up the boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, like go ahead and cheat on them, and then see if they're going to be a good boyfriend or girlfriend afterwards. But for the most part, you don't have control over that. What you do have control over is how you behave. And the fact that they don't behave the way that they ought to really has nothing to do with you. You still have control. You have a choice in whether you <laughs> fulfill your duties or not. And whether you're a good person from a stoic point of view is going to depend on whether you do your duties and whether you mold yourself into the kind of person who can reliably do their duties, even if they're facing the kind of adversity that we all do face in this world that we live in. So, um, it's an interesting moral theory. You know, think about whether it could work for you. Um, there's certain elements that are, that are certainly very attractive. You might not, you know, buy the whole package. So, I know I certainly don't myself. So, and uh, I'll see you on uh, Tuesday.